before I begin speaking, you got that. I'd just like to give a, a one minute behind the scenes of what's going on in my mind right now. Um, Brother Polite called today the Day of Atonement because I'm going to atone for the sins of the white man. That's, that's what he wants to have happen. Um, so, you know, when I took it seriously, I'm treating it like the Day of Atonement. I'm fasting over 24 hours right now, except for little sips of water I haven't eaten, because that's what the, the high priest of Israel did on the Day of Atonement. I'm not saying I'm the high priest, but I wanted to align with the theme. I didn't sleep last night. I was up studying, because the high priest of Israel didn't sleep. So I'm in that state of mind. Actually, we have a holiday coming up this, this week, a Jewish holiday called Purim. And the Day of Atonement in Hebrew is Yom Kippur, which means the day like Purim teach you the Day of Atonement doesn't come close to the highness of the Purim holidays coming up this week. So Brother Polite may not have known it, but he set this up beautifully for me this week. I'm, I'm feeling in the moment. Okay. Thank you. That's my piece. I know I just lost a few minutes. I got it. Okay. Let's go. Okay. So Brother Polite wants to talk about the Jewish people and the God of the Jewish people, etc. I want to suggest that no one in this room, and no one in my community, from the Jewish community, <clears throat> may even have a clue what the Torah is talking about. What is the narrative about? We have to understand that first, before if we could decide if it's applicable to us or not. So I'm going to try to come here and clarify that for us. This first image is just a, you know, just the opening image. This is actually my farm. You're looking at the mountains of Gilboa right now. Um, yeah, thank God. I, I cashed off the dollar a long time ago. I'm out. Um, so I'd like to begin. When I look at ancient religions and I would look at ancient cultures, <coughs> excuse me, there's one theme that I see that pulsates, that carries out throughout each culture. And it's a talk about a certain part of our brain, a certain piece of, you know, molecular structure that we have, which is called the pineal gland. You guys don't have to make any noise, but you can raise your hand if you've ever heard of it. Beautiful, great, so good, let's go. I'm excited now, you know about it. Let's dig it a little deeper then. <clears throat> we got a picture of the brain right here. We see where the pineal gland is, right? Please keep it down, please keep it down. I'll go a little, Quiet, a little more focused in. You can see that it's actually a part of our brain. They call it the third eye. It actually has muscle structures like the eye. It's actually light sensitive where it secretes hormones, melatonin, serotonin, that are light sensitive. So that's why it's called the third eye, the pineal gland, right? It happens to be out of some of the chemicals that secrete from the pineal gland. Naturally, there's a secretion that's psychoactive. They call it entheogenic. It's called dimethyltryptamine, DMT. Now I'm going there right now. It's a neurological stimulus that can come from our own third eye that we produce to take us to psychoactive states. Anyone ever heard of that? Great, let's keep going. Let's do it. Now, you, you see that I'm just showing some images of the brain, what it looks like when you get stimulated and it secretes. Okay. This is what the chemical itself looks like, dimethyltryptamine. So you see, I'm not talking metaphysical. I'm, I'm in the world of science here. Okay. There was a book written about it. A Jewish, uh, happened to be a Jewish researcher, worked for the U.S. government, did tests in the 1950s on DMT. He called it the spirit molecule because all the subjects he tested, to, uh, you know, after they were subjected to the chemical experience, they all had a spiritual rejuvenation. They all came out, they new people, whatever traumas they had, they dropped it. It was said it was the most profound moment of their life. He even wrote a book about it comparing DMT to prophecy of the ancient people of Israel. Now I want to go to a verse in Genesis right here because we see something very interesting. You all, everyone can see it clearly? Beautiful. It said, and Jacob called the name of the place Pineal, for I have seen God face to face, and my life is preserved. Now this was after Jacob fought an angel of Esau. He says, I'm going to name the place Pineal because I saw God face to face. Now where else in the Torah do we see this face to face thing happen? It's with Moses. When God spoke to Moses, he also had a face-to-face -face revelation. And when the Torah uses words more than once, it's implying something, showing you that there's a theme that's carrying over. So we see the narrative of Moses was also very heavily involved in the pineal gland. Interesting enough, you can extract dimethyltryptamine. Not only is it produced in our brain, you could extract it from acacia. Hmm. 
Interesting. Where are we going to go with this? Here we go. We have in Exodus, the Israelites left Israel with acacia wood, or left Egypt with acacia wood. And the commentators say they used to stare at the acacia wood and they used to have faith. And Jacob foresaw that they would one day need it. So when they got to Egypt, before anything went down, they planted the fields of acacia. And now all of a sudden, the whole story culminates with the temple in Jerusalem where you have a high priest of Israel. What does he do in that, that one room one day a year? No one really knows, but it's right in front of our face. The verse tells us he went with two things in his hand, a pan of hot coals and a pan of blended incense, extracts from plants. He puts the coals on the floor and he puts the extracts on the coals. The whole room bursts into a cloud of smoke. The law says he's got to wait in the room a few minutes for the whole room to become full with smoke. And then he could leave. So I'm, that's why I press pause. I'm like, wait a minute, wait a minute. Are you trying to tell me that this story starts off with a man in a garden having a bad relationship with a tree, getting kicked out of the garden, forms a nation of people for the sake of returning one day to that garden, and the first place that these people go to is Egypt, where they start planting trees, stare at the trees for a few hundred years, leave Egypt with those trees, start making extracts in the desert, and it all culminates in a, in a, in a room in a holy temple where one man's standing in smoke from plant extract. Now, if you can't see that this story is about the, the narrative of humanity and plants, about our origins and connection to the universe, you're not reading the Torah. This is, this is a call out to the community uh, across the world as well as my Jewish community that we don't have this understanding of our own book. I'd like to move forward a little bit. Interesting enough, here we got a picture of uh, the Garden of Eden where the whole thing starts. I should have gone to that slide first. But this is, this is the mission that all humanity is on right now, right? Returning to Eden, returning to Edenic consciousness. Interesting enough for our Egyptian folks and fellows in here, which I have a lot of respect for, you see the pineal gland also playing a serious role in ancient comedic wisdom. I know the temples were built about, around ratios, the body, perfect math, where you had certain high rooms where it represented the pineal gland. And if anyone wants to correct me, you could, but I'm not sure if this eye, I'm under the impression that it has a lot to do with the structure of the brain and certain parts of our brain, correct? This is the eye that's on Brother Polite's face. Even more so, I was learning that, and please correct me, this, I, I don't think there's too many credible sources out there, but I'm trying. Isis and Osiris were said to have merged from the acacia tree. That's part of Egyptian myth. So I'm, I'm, I'm looking a little bit deeper into this. I'm like, what's really going on here? And before I continue, I just want to press pause for a second and make this assessment. Yes, it's going to get heavy. Now, let's say these ancient cultures learned how to force or learned how to control that third eye where they can go to other states of consciousness, right? While they're in their awake state. Let's say that is happening, which we believe it is. I would like to know, you know, it was, it was a big deal when Brother Polite went to Egypt. I remember, I was learning, watching, following the community. Everyone said, you never went to Egypt? He says, I'm going to go to Egypt now. He went to Egypt. But I want to know, has Brother Polite been to where the Egyptians were going? Was he in that state of mind ever? Has his third eye ever been opened? Has he ever had a dimethyltryptamine secretion? Because if you haven't, you're going to start looking at these images on the wall and you're not really going to be able to connect to them because, unless you have ever gone to that space. Now I'm going to go on air right now and say I didn't always have a beard. I've been there. I used to, you know, I was out there. One friend tricked me once. I had that experience. I had my third eye open. I felt what that was like. So now when I see ancient cultures start speaking about acacia and images and symbolism, I have a whole new appreciation for it. So part of the conversation tonight is going to have to be, you know, we're speaking about Egyptian and ancient science. Has Brother Polite gone there? Okay, that's one thing. I'm going to go a little forward right now. This is just the tip of the iceberg. Let's look at the pyramids of Egypt for a second. Well, I'm not going to say if the, Jew, if the Israelites built them or not. The Torah says they built Pitom and Ramses. We'll get to that. But the one thing is for sure. You have the inside of, the, of this great pyramid, right? Anyone know what's going on in the inside there? They say it's the king's chamber. Was someone buried there? No. They didn't find any graves. There's actually an emptied out 
a box in there that would have been the same size as the Ark of the Covenant, right? It's just sitting there empty. Now, if you look at it, and I did a little study, and this is very scientific, the inside of the chamber is lined with quartz crystal. Now, we all know scientifically, if you vibrate quartz crystal at a certain frequency, it secretes electricity, right? This is science. This is nothing metaphysical. We believe, as far as my tradition goes, ancient Egypt was producing electricity. What they were doing with that electricity, we could have a whole other conversation. Potentially mind expansion, potentially moving heavy things, potentially traveling at high speeds at different places. But it didn't take you know, all these years to get the Benjamin Franklin to put a key on a, on a, you know, a kite to figure this out. These gentlemen built the pyramids, obviously, and knew how to harness the Earth's natural energy. So let's assume the Egyptians are, are, you know, are building with electricity technology, right? What's the first thing that happens when the Israelites leave Egypt? The Ark of the Covenant, right? They build the Ark of the Covenant. Now, if I'm an electrician reading the story of the Torah, I'm going to come to a very quick and logical conclusion. The Ark of the Covenant is electricity technology. Check this out. They take the Ark and they line it. You have wood in between and a gold on, a plate on the outside and a, and a gold plate on the inside. Anytime you take two conductors and separate them by a non-conductor, you're building a capacitor, something that could store and discharge electricity. Now let me show you a sample of a capacitor right here. You got a layer, the copper, you know, you got a, a, a conductor layer, the silver layer here on one end, on the other end, you got something in the middle separating them. And then you got two rods coming out, one for negative, one for positive. So obviously now we have an Ark of the Covenant. You got two metals separated by a non-conductor with two metal golden cherubim, they call them angels, but really we're acting as rods on top, one to the negative, one to the positive. Now we're 100% certain that the ancient people of Israel were able to store and, and discharge electricity at their will. This, this is not advanced technology. This should be clear as day to anyone studying these texts. Now, this sounds a little far-fetched, but fast forward now to the early 1900s. You have Nikola Tesla. I'm sure we've all heard of him, right? He made free wireless electricity. Who was funding him? J.P. Morgan, the bankers. Right? When they realized they couldn't monetize his patent, they pulled their funding out from him. And they went with renewable electricity sources like coal and etc., which we're still stuck in today. We're still in that. We also have to ask why the US government take all of his patents. Nikolai Tesla's patents are, are taken. This was, this was information that could have brought us back and liberated us. Now, now it's going to get a little controversial. We're speaking about the bankers. You got a Jew on stage talking about bankers. <laughs> Where am I going with this? <laughs> I'm not afraid of you guys, that's for sure. Yeah. That, that was a compliment, because when you speak about this, you know who I'm, who I'm ruffling. Mm -hmm. You're all very kind people in here. The Rothschilds. Let's go there. The Rothschilds started these banks, right? Loaning money, which was actually a result of the, of the law that Jews couldn't own land in Europe and they were only able to be money launderers. I mean, money lenders, excuse me. Money, money laundering happens when you have money lending. Well, hear me out. I'm about to build. I'm about to build. You guys with me? Thank you. Now, in ancient Europe, when, it, when, a Jew, when you owed a Jew money, you know what you did? You killed them because you had no laws against killing Jews and your debt disappeared. So Jews had a lot of trauma in them from the fact that they only were able to loan money and most of the time the people they owed money to came and killed them. So the Rothschilds had this whole psychosis trauma about that whole money wealth and they actually had family members scattered throughout Europe so it was very easy for them to move money and have trust. But the interesting thing is most people don't know. The Rothschilds was not their real last name. It was Bauer, it was a Jewish last name. Rothschilds, they changed it to, means Red Shield, which is a Freemasonic name. They were clearly not identifying with the Jewish people and their children clearly had no intentions to stay within the Jewish people because they married barons and baronesses all throughout Europe, disconnecting themselves from the Jewish people. And yeah, you do see that certain 
Families were financing the same exact wars, both sides of the wars since Napoleon, owning the media that provoked those wars. All the way up until modern day, we're still dealing with this, with this situation. The last seven nations we went to war with never accepted the central bank. You know, Afghanistan, North Korea, Libya, Iraq, they never accepted the central bank. It should be clear to everyone what the agenda is, why we're going to war. So this G in the middle of the star, this lets me know that they're not on my team. Okay, I'm gonna move forward a little. I'm gonna give you our version of how we understand all this because you know I live in Israel right now and you clearly see Israel had the Belfour Declaration signed in 1915, which was the Rothschilds pressuring England to say we'll bring America into the war if you give us Israel because we want our place to have our own dominion, right? Let me, let me go a little farther now into my version of the whole thing. It says in Exodus, when the Israelites left Egypt, they left with a mixed multitude. What is the mixed multitude? We teach it was the Egyptian aristocrats that fled with the Israelites because they wanted to join aboard what they were doing. And then all of a sudden happens the golden calf, where we were about to go back to Edenic consciousness, and we lost it. We, we dropped down because of the golden calf. And actually, we blame the golden calf on the mixed multitude. We say they initiated it and started it. And after the sin of the golden calf, you had about 3,000 people were killed amongst the nation. That makes up about 0.5, about 1% of the people. So all of a sudden you see this 1%, 99% happening in ancient times, right? That's what we're talking about today. The 1%, the 99%, 1% of the world today owns 99% of the wealth. That's not right. Now hear me out. Now on Wall Street today, look what we have. This is in Manhattan. This is not just symbolism. This is they're invoking something. This is a similar entity, a similar force, still in presence today. This is where the bankers are, are, are you know, they're, getting, they're letting us know, basically. It's on our dollar bills, this Freemasonic stuff. It's in our capital. It's in Jerusalem. It's in Israel. This, this obelisk is by the Supreme Court in Israel. And it was donated by Rothschild, Dorothy de Rothschild. That's her park. You got a pyramid in the south of, Egypt, uh, south of Israel by a lot. So once you enter Israel, you're greeted with a Freemasonic pyramid. So they're letting us know they're there. Who are they? I don't know. My rabbis don't know. We're trying to get to the bottom of it. I'm on the ground. One second. I don't want to. I don't want to. You know, throw any shots out there. But we're gonna have to go there because Brother Polite's gonna come at me real hard in a few minutes. He's gonna. Yelling at me. So, so I got, I just want to ask some questions. I'm allowed to, right? So, I got some phone calls throughout these past few months, and I know Son Eder hates when someone from the African American community calls me to talk to me. He absolutely hates it. But there's some humans out there that just, they could talk to each other. And I don't want to implicate anyone, but I know this. The Freemasonic thing exists amongst the community, exists amongst people in this room. So maybe they could shed light on it to me because I have no clue what they're talking about, what, what's on my dollar. If, if you're aligned with these Rothschilds, if you're not, if you're going back to your Egyptian sources, but why are you using the same names and same fraternities? I'm going to ask some serious questions about this because it really perturbs me. I don't know if Brother Polite is or is not Freemasonic. I dropped it to him before. He didn't say no. I was told that maybe he was part of the Blue, the Blue Lodge, the Scottish Rites, or he once was, so maybe he could shed light. I know it's dangerous for me to start saying this stuff, but I'm sick and tired of it. I'm sitting back on the sidelines watching. I even see a shirt over there on the wall with a Freemasonic uh, sign on it. So what, what, you know, what is that? You know what I'm saying? I'm sure when Brother Flight comes on, he can break it down to me, because I'm curious about this, because I see I'm trying to make a theme here, a story, right. No, I'm not out of time. I got some time. I got some time. Now let me talk about... Quiet, please. Please be quiet, let's speak. One of my great-great-grandparents was one of the greatest rabbis in the last 1,000 years in Europe. His name was the Vilna Gon Rabbi Eliyahu Kramer. I'm going to start reading what he says. It's, it's deep, but I'm going to go there. He says, the purpose of gathering in the exiles of Israel is to wage God's war against Amalek which was the main mission of Joshua in line with Mashiach ben Yosef 
The war against Amalek includes every aspect against all the enemies of Israel, including Armelis, the prince of the mixed multitude. What is that about? Armelis, the prince of the mixed multitude. Here, one second before I go there. Um, we're dealing with this mixed multitude in Israel right now on the ground. I'm going to let you know, being a citizen of Israel, politically what it's like. The people on the ground do not align with the rulership over there. And it, it really culminated in the last few weeks because you have the government pushing the reform movement, which is clearly a Freemasonic funded industry to, to take God out of the picture and to destroy the Torah. So we're starting to put up a lot of, a lot of red flags. And my rabbi told me just this weekend, it blew my mind, and I'm going to tell you something you're going to hear before the Jews, and it's controversial, but I'm not scared. Armelis is the same letters rearranged as an Israeli politician who is always identified as the mixed multitude, as the leader of them. Because the actions he did when in Israel, he uprooted Jews from their own land and caused strife amongst the people. The greatest rabbis of Israel declared him officially the leader of the mixed multitude. His name, re rearranged, is the same exact letters as Armelis over here, and his name was Ehud Omer. And my rabbi said he's been waiting a long time, but last month, he was arrested in Israel for corruption. And my rabbi said when that happened, it was a sign that we're in a new generation, that we can move forward and we could take this, we could take this, we could do this, we could bring prosperity and peace to the world. But the leadership that we believed was corrupt has been arrested. That's a sign in the spiritual world. Now, I'm not coming up with my own theory here. I'm re-repeating what my rabbi says, which is a very safe thing to do in my religion, to re-repeat what your rabbi says. So this is what he told me, it blew my mind. Now, moving forward, we're talking about Israel. You got this concept of the lost tribes, and you, everyone knows I'm going to go there a little bit. I got Obadja, it says they're coming from Spain. I got Zephania, that says they're coming from Africa. I got Isaiah saying they're coming from all four corners of the earth. So this is actually what's happening in Israel today. You know, the leadership is changing, the people are changing, there's the law of chaos. So whatever these Rothschilds, whoever financed this whole thing intended, it clearly spun well out of control. Because my great-grandfather, earlier to the Zionist movement, he started sending his students to Israel and they're still till today thriving. So there's definitely a duality, so I came here to let everyone in this room know my perspective and the perspective of the people on the ground, because I feel like that's very important, because we're dealing with a lot of YouTube education out there, um, and there's a lot of room for misinformation, and a lot of people speak on behalf of, of me and my community, so I've taken the opportunity to come here and share where we're coming from. Now, if you look at the, t the trail of the lost tribes, I don't know if I could zoom in here, does it work? Uh, no, we lost that. Hold on. I'll read it to you. We got 722 before the Common Era. We get exiled towards the Far East. About 22 years later, the Pashtun nation is founded in Afghanistan, who claims to be the children of Israel, Bani Israel. They're number 25 million today. They have Israelite names, customs, and traditions. They're straight out of the playbook. Afghanistan is called the graveyard of, of empires because no one's been able to conquer them. They've been the same exact people for 2,700 years. You move a little forward down the Silk Road, you got Buddhism. Founded within 20 years of the Pashtun. The first two students of the Buddha were Pashtun Israelites. If you go a little forward down the Silk Road, you go to the Shinto culture, the Shinto kingdom, the oldest monarchy in the world, 2,600 years old about. All this happened within 60 years. They claim to have been a chosen nation from an ancient homeland, exiled and reestablished. It's so far much to go that you got the Golden Ark in Japan. This is their Golden Ark that they have on Mount Moriah in Japan, the same name as the mountain where King Solomon's temple was. And they're claiming this. So if you really follow the history and follow the cultures of who's saying what today, there is an Israelite identity. Now here we go here, the Igbo is in Israel. I don't know if anyone's ever seen this book, but this is a must read. This was written not by a Jew, because I know Brother Polite wants to say, you Jews or missionaries are telling my people who they are. This was written by an Igbo tribal leader. And I read about this culture, and I know Brother Polite's Igbo. I hope I don't know as much about his culture as he does. Uh, but I read there, and there is straight up, everything they're doing is very mosaic. It has a lot to do with the laws of Moses, and almost nothing to do with Christian influence. Because, as a matter of fact, the people who are Christian in Igbo land today are, are leaving it and returning to what they believe their original roots of the law of Moses. Now, you got the slave trade. Deuteronomy 28:68. It says, we're going to bring you from your land on ships again. 
And according to our Jewish teachings, there is a second slavery that happens. It didn't happen to me. You look at the historical records, how much percentage of the slave trade was Igbo? A tremendous percent. They came from their coast. So all of a sudden, you got people in Africa saying, we are from the tribes of Islam, and everyone's looking like, yeah, that makes total sense. Josephus said millions of you fled into Africa. Here, all of a sudden, you are preserved 40 million people strong with all this culture. And all of a sudden, you're fulfilling biblical prophecy coming to this country. So there's some purpose over there also. But I'd like to say to the Hebrew Israelites in the room, is just because you may fulfill Deuteronomy 28:68 doesn't mean the four corners of the world can't take a role in the ingathering as well. It's going to be a team effort. I'm going to stress that. I'm going to move forward a little bit. This is a map. I don't know how many people are currently focused on what's going on politically in Nigeria. Nigeria suffers the same fate as the people of Israel, myself, and the people of Afghanistan, which means borders that were drawn by the British people that were not real borders. So Nigeria now is the Yoruba tribe mixed with the Igbo tribe and something called Nigeria, when really it was supposed to be Biafra, Igbo land. And there was a genocide, they had their own holocaust that we don't acknowledge, and they're going through a lot of pain. So that's why I see you taking that photo. <laughs> So what I've, what I've done, and you know, we're a little late, so I'm kind of going con to condense my whole, my whole story here, but um, part of my efforts is not me. What I've done with a group of people is we've built a social network where the people who say they're from the House of Israel are logging themselves in and identifying themselves. So if you look here, this is just a week or two of being live. We have Biafra trying to go independent on this network, declaring themselves an Thank you. An independent people of Israel in Nigeria. I don't know if anyone knows that that's actually going on. If you follow Radio Biafra and the politics on the ground, they're trying to go separate from Nigeria with the theme of being from the people of Israel. That's happening. There's no one influencing that except for the tribal leaders on the ground out there. So what we're doing here is we're mapping it out. Each village has their own crowdfunding campaigns where we can bring sustainable technology to them uh, because my plan, obviously, is going to revolve around decentralization. If I have this concept called the banks and this air of Rav and this leadership that's on, that's on top of us, the logical solution is to not point our fingers and yell about them. If we're the ones holding them up, they're standing on a board over the stage and I'm standing on this board holding them up. Instead of pointing and talking about them, I just step off the board and they disappear. So are we going to spend time focusing on who's evil? Or are we going to spend time figuring out how to get off of the people that are evil? Because, because I believe we're wasting our time. We all know what we're up against, that's for sure. But we're all still financing it. Do you understand? That's the issue. When we're going to have our own communities, where we make our own electricity, we have our own food systems, we're going to be autonomous. I like that aquaponic shout out, that's exactly what we're doing on our farm. We're growing fish and we're taking water from the fish and pumping it into the greenhouse. The greenhouse is growing off nutrients of the fish. They're filtering the water, sending it back to the fish, clean 99% recycled water loop. This is the technology that'll scale, that'll liberate us. Why do you have to go to a job to go buy food that's poison? We're eating poison. I'll tell you one thing, we're speaking about poison quickly before my time's up, is there's one chemical, how am I doing? Good. There's one chemical in particular that calcates our pineal gland, that dries it out. I know we're not allowed to talk right now, but I'll give anyone in the audience a chance to raise your hand if you know this one. What's drying out our pineal gland? On the money, fluoride. Awesome. We have to be so aware of this. Right. I love it. Thank you. The first, when was the first time fluoride was ever put in the water system, though? Right, to kill me. She's right, we're putting Nazi Germany in the Jewish ghettos in the concentration camp. And today we're still brushing our teeth with it and drinking it into the water like it's okay. That's not okay. It dries out our third eye. Now here's, here's going to be my only and my, my low blow, my, my shot all night long. So I don't want to take one. It's, it's hard for me to do this. I'm telling you, it's, gonna, it's really hard. But brother, brother Polite, I caught you brushing your teeth with fluoride. I did, we had that weigh in, you had that arm and hammer. My, that, that like, boom, that hit, it, that hit it off of me. Anyone who had their third eye open to have that experience, there's no chance you would ever touch fluoride. So the question remains, you've been to Egypt, have you been to where the Egyptians are going to? And I'm gonna, I'm gonna say, I'm gonna come to why I'm saying all this. Uh, here's a good picture of the aquaponics, what we're trying to do with this technology scaling it out to Africa, because Israel today, as much as you see that there is a lot of 
things to complain about of, as far as the global order, right? They're also booming in sustainable technology. I don't know if anyone realizes the water crisis going on in the world today. Israel's on top of that. I mentioned it before, but they really are here to scale their technology to the world to help us become free humans again. Now, I'd like to just close. I got, you see, my Theological Research Institute. What is my practical model? What's my implementation of everything I just said? I actually have a partnership with State University of New York, and we're launching this summer. I have a decentralized college program, which means every single village and community in America, we can keep our kids home. They could actually study the seven laws of Noah to create courts and structures, study agriculture, and study their maths and sciences. So basically what's happening is this is distance learning. You're going to get your bachelor's degree from staying in your community, making it green. So instead of sending our youths off to universities where they learn Greek Delta you know, fraternity stuff, we keep them home. We solve the, the debt of the, student, of the student bubble, which Mark Cuban says is the greatest threat to Americans today. So what I'd like to see is people staying in their communities, learning how to make electricity, learning how to be healthy in their minds, learning how to grow their own foods, produce their own foods. I mean, that's what I'm trying to say. If Brother Fly is not going to come up here and say the same thing as me, there's got to be an issue because I've read the comments everyone here has had from previous debates. No one is interested in yelling or fighting anymore or pointing fingers. We want to know what's a plan of action. And All right. He's past his 30 minutes. He got a five-minute grace period. We in that town now. Right. Um, dang. No, I, I, I turned it up with the fluoride punch. I'm telling you, that was huge for me. I don't, I don't have it in me to, to be mean, I'm telling you, I'm a peaceful guy. Um, but in all honesty, as I'm about to conclude, I'm sure Brother Polite's about to come up here and do a number on me. He's about to yell at me. He's going to put me on trial. I'm okay with it. I'll listen to it. But what I hope is he speaks about men who are evil in the past few hundred years. I must request he identify which fraternity they belong to that was not Torah-based. Because almost, almost all of those men belong to secret societies that I absolutely know nothing about, which that logo was on that shirt right there, on the wall. Someone's going to have to do some explaining right now. I'm serious. I'm a human and I deserve answers, right? I share the same earth as you. And let me tell you one thing for sure while I have these final minutes, because what I already said is dangerous. You all know I just threw myself out there. I threw some of my people under the bus, but I'm going to finish off. No, I got a few more minutes. Sorry, ma'am. Now, the people who financed World War I and potentially World War II, because of my nature of where I live and what I know, I know there's a World War III in preparation. And you don't know if it's going to be in the next few weeks or this summer. This is a luxury that we're getting here together to do this. You, I believe your community can solve this. Because you guys span every single city in this, in this country. And if there was unity amongst yourself, people like me would benefit from it greatly. Because you could steer us in the right direction. I'm so sure of it. I'm trying to prevent World War III. And the idea of my social network I built, which is amongst other people, is each village should log themselves in and have communication with other villages. The conscious community now exists on Facebook. Facebook is absolute garbage. All I see is pictures of people beating each other up, embarrassing each other. We're encouraging our youth to do things silly just to get on and get likes. The whole system's got to go. We have to reinvigorate how we socialize on these social networks. It's got to be to heal us and save us. Don't, and please don't discredit me. I, I'm not, I understand. We spoke about it before. You guys got the melanin. You guys are Ferraris. I'm a Toyota. I'm okay with that. It's okay. But I am also of the same genetic makeup of Mark Zuckerberg. I am his DNA as well. So there could be creativity that can come from me as well. And it's for the community to judge. And I, like I said, from here, I go back to my farm. I go back to Israel, I cashed off the dollar. I'm not just talking about this from a building in Queens. I left, I got land, I make my own food. I have young families living there rent-free and in exchange they get to live. 
I encourage everyone, instead of complaining about living in high rent buildings here, there's an agenda that wants you in those buildings. Get out. Go back to the land, whether it's Vermont, or whether it's Africa. Go somewhere where we could be sustainable. It could be anywhere. And we should live in a time where the borders that are political today don't separate us. Now, on that note, I'm ready to get yelled at. I'm ready to put stars on, you know, in the, in the, in the slave trade. I, I see it all, but I want to know who these guys are associated with. 60, no, what do people usually do in their last 60 seconds? An acapella rap battle, right? What happens? They give it their all, right? I respect that. I, I said my piece. If I speak any further more tonight, it's going to be about science and math found within the Torah to show you that there are things in there that no man could have thought of thousands of years, which are new discoveries thanks to computer technology. Over and out. Much love. Give it up for Harry Rosenberg.